On behalf of the Professional Baseball Strength and Conditioning Coaches Society, I'd like to welcome you to the PBS CCS podcast. I'm your host, Chris Messina. everybody i'm here with eric ortigo of the cleveland indians organization eric thanks for coming on man appreciate your time tell the listeners about yourself if you would please well first of all thanks for thanks for having me on uh like chris said i am a strength and conditioning coach within the the uh, minor league system um i'm currently right now for the last two seasons this is my third year but for the last two seasons i've been with our high a club in lynchburg virginia the lynchburg hillcats in the carolina league uh, I just completed my third season, like I said. Uh, and so tell me about your journey to this role. Is there anything between school and baseball that kind of got you in, or did you go right from school to baseball? Yeah, so I started off in college. Uh, I went to a junior college where I played baseball. That was LSU at Eunice, uh, obviously a small school in South Louisiana. And uh, we didn't have we didn't have a strength coach. So while I was there, our position coaches, our pitching coach, as well as our hitting coach, were our strength and conditioning coaches. And I thought they did a good job. They got us they got us really big and strong. And it was a very basic program. But it was something that I think they came up with together. Uh, once I transferred out, uh, I went to the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. I, I, I just kept thinking about how I enjoyed the, uh, the process of preparing physically. For baseball more than I actually enjoyed I think the act of playing baseball itself so towards the end of my uh, college career there I um, saw something where, where they were showing our strength and conditioning coach and kind of highlighting him and letting him talk about his job similar to what I'm doing right now and uh, it strike a lot of interest so I, I wanted to work for him I, I didn't know exactly how to go about doing it so I didn't, I didn't call him. I didn't email him. I just said one day I, I got up the nerve and I just walked into his office. I asked if he was there. And uh, it was right before the spring semester of my last semester of undergrad. And I walked in there and his name was uh, Coach Rusty Witt. And I walked in there and I think I kind of took him by surprise. And I asked him if I could work on his staff. It's as simple as that. And he kind of looked at me, shrugged his shoulders. And he's like, you know, I don't have any any paid opportunities for you and I told him I wasn't looking for that and uh, he said sure yeah um come um come to our staff meeting and it was like the next day at 1 30 or something so that's when it started when he gave me the opportunity not only to work with his football program but also to work with uh, the baseball program there stay there for a couple more months then I graduated once I graduated uh I went to graduate school not having a graduate assistantship or anything. I went to the University of Louisiana at Monroe. Um, after a couple of months of just sitting there and going to school, I, I, I couldn't stop thinking about uh, strength and conditioning and how I wanted to explore that a little bit more. So I I emailed two of the coaches there, the head the head strength coach, Joe Girardi, and the, um, and the assistant director over there, who was Brett Huth at the time. And, uh, yeah, they gave, me, they gave me an opportunity to come in and I worked as an intern for a little bit, and then I transformed into a graduate assistant role. And I worked there until the end of my tenure in 2013. And then I wasn't even looking. <laughs> I wasn't looking for a job. And someone called me about a job at uh, McNeese State University, which is a smaller Division One school in South Louisiana, and uh, struck up a lot of interest. And I went there, and I, I fell in love with the school as soon as I got there. Said, man, this is a spot. So I went there. I was hired. Went there for three years, and then uh, and then I got a job with the Cleveland Indians. And like I said, I just completed my third season there, and it's been nothing but uh, but good experiences so far. Yeah, a couple of things strike me in that one. First, the the thought of liking to prepare more than actually playing just sticks with me so much. I used to love just the training and even like practice was good for me. And then I'd get to the game and I was like, eh, this isn't doing it for me, but uh, find me right. in the gym and I'm 
So I, that rings with me, and I think it probably rings with a few other strength coaches. That's just why we got in, because we love the physical aspect of it. And then the other thing is just paying your dues, man. Like, you yeah. you walk right into the coach's office and say, hey, I want to work for you. And I don't have the experience, but I'm willing to learn. Um, and that goes a long, long way. And I'm kind of in the same boat. My first time in strength and conditioning, I didn't know what I was doing. The coach just threw me in the fire and was like, here you go, learn on your own. And that's a good good experience for you to kind of figure out, okay, I really do want to do this or I really don't. It sounds like you really did want to do it right from the start. Yeah, yeah, that was a uh, that was a crazy experience. Me walking into his office, I'm not sure if he if he liked that or he didn't, but uh, but uh, and that was that was the only way. That was the most respectful way I thought I could have gone about doing it. Yeah, man, I, I think I think he liked it. <laughs> if he if he brought you on, I think he liked it. So, uh, what is your best professional baseball story? Whether it's uh, something that got lost in translation early or a success story that you've seen, just what's your favorite memory from baseball so far? Yeah, so I mean, I have a couple of them, but I'm, I'm gonna tell one specifically. First of all, I, I love seeing whenever our uh, our guys get called up to the big leagues. Obviously, we've had probably a handful of guys, even in the short amount of time I've been here, that have gotten called up and are still on the big league team. But uh, one that kind of really stands out to me, it's got nothing to do with strength and conditioning. It's just kind of funny, and you kind of have to know the guy. I'm gonna try not to say his name, but I might. Um, it, it, we were both in our, our first year with the organization and he was a young left-handed pitcher and it was towards the end of the year. This was in 2017. So we were in low A and like I said, towards the end of the year, we're playing at West Michigan. Uh, I mean, they're just beating the ball all over the yard. I mean, they were really good. They won like a hundred games that year and we came close to losing a hundred. So He's pitching, and it's in the third inning, and, I mean, balls are just going everywhere. No one's catching it. Every ball's in a power alley or over the wall. And I see him, every time he comes to back up third base, he's looking in the dugout, like staring intently in the dugout. I guess he was looking at our manager and our pitching coach. So he comes out of the game. We're losing, like, 10-3. to three. We, go, we go up to the clubhouse. I walk up there with him. And he's just like shaking his head and he's like, E, he's like, man, they were hitting everything today. I said, I said, yeah, I saw that. Um, why, why'd you keep looking into the dugout? He's like, he stopped for a second. <laughs> he kind of put his head down and he started laughing like this. And he said, E, he said, it's the third inning. They got 10 runs. Come get me out of the game. So I'm guessing that he wanted to come out of the game because, I mean, balls are going everywhere. It was crazy. Yeah. The guys that know him, they know exactly how he said it. And it was uh, it was pretty funny. Yeah, that's hilarious, man. It's, especially <laughs> at those younger levels, some of those guys just – they sometimes they get a little lost on the mound. And then even if it's like balls that are just falling in and guys just aren't catching it and it's just placed right and they're just throwing their hands up, it's like – What's going on? I can't, I can't get him right. out. And the manager's like, no, keep going, man. Yeah. He was like, he's got to get out of this. He's got to. <laughs> yeah. you got to love it at those lower levels, man. Sometimes guys just got to wear it. Oh, he wore it all right, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, what do you believe in within strength and conditioning that others think you are crazy for believing? Yeah. And I don't, I don't necessarily think that they would think I'm, I'm crazy for this, but this is just something especially it kind of uh, rings a bell with professional baseball. You know, everything in professional baseball is or, or it's starting to get more individualized. They've got individualized strength and conditioning programs to a certain extent, individualized pitching, hitting, mental performance, all kind of stuff. But uh, things that I really think that, continue to be important is organization discipline and last but not least teamwork i think our our organization i can only speak for us but they do they do a they do a great job of all those things from an organizational standpoint as a coach you've got to lay out your expectations if you never lay out your expectations to the players you're going to get a a ton of different things like but but if you tell them exactly how you want things done i think it kind of sets the standard of um of how you want them to act in your room or just around you in general 
Um, the second thing, like I said, being disciplined. I, I think everyone knows that there's a right way and a wrong way to do things. And if you know the right way and the wrong way, why would you ever do the wrong way? So that, that's just my, my small little take on the discipline aspect. And then uh, teamwork, everyone should help everybody. Uh, I think our organization does a great job. They put team on, on almost everything that we, that we talk about. Um, you know, you're going to have guys, let's take the pitching, pitching staff, for example. Certain guys are going to be good at certain different things. So essentially, you could have five or six different leaders on that pitching staff to help out the rest of the guys. Younger guys, less developed guys, or guys just, that just don't have the skills that maybe another guy has. So I think it's good if, if everyone's supposed to help everybody out and they do do that, we could have a bunch of leaders on our team and, and we, could, we could have great experiences moving forward with that. Yeah, man, that's actually really awesome. I'm, I'm a believer in discipline, consistency, and work ethic myself. So those, those make sense to me. Um, and then, like you said, if you lay out the, the expectations early on, um, you're not backtracking because if you just go in and like, all right, you guys can do what you want, and then you're like, ah, no, wait, you can't do that. It's like, well, you never told us you can't do that. If you put the standard at, at the beginning, then you can kind of provide some wiggle room where you need to when guys have earned that. Um, but I'm a big believer in that. Lay out your expectations early. Let them know this is what I expect. This is what we're going to do, and these are the consequences of not doing it. So I'm, I'm there with you 100%. Yeah, certainly. So yeah. Uh, what makes a strength and conditioning coach successful in your mind? Maybe in general and then more specifically in professional baseball. Yeah, I guess I'll talk about it in general first. First of all, I'm, I'm still trying to learn how to be successful my, uh, myself. But let's not skip over the obvious. And you've got to work hard and want to get your hands dirty. I could remember uh, early on when I, I first accepted a full-time job, and I would do speed sessions with, with the whole team. I mean, I'd be out there sometimes at 4.30 in the morning. I didn't have any interns. I didn't necessarily want any either, but I didn't have any. So I was setting up everything. It was all the sleds, all the weight that goes on the sleds, as well as the harnesses and stuff. I mean, that's, that's something you definitely cannot be lazy about those things. Uh, that would probably be the first thing. Uh, I believe it's important to have uh, – an open mindset, or as we call it now, a growth mindset, so that you could, you never, you never know everything. And if I would go back over some of the stuff that I was doing as a young coach compared to, to what I know or what I do now, man, I'd, I'd be kicking myself in the, I'd be kicking myself in the foot a lot because I was probably doing some stuff that wasn't, that wasn't great. But it's also, I think, uh, important to get other, other people's opinion, other coaches whether it be other strength coaches, other sport coaches, but also to develop a, a great relationship with your players so that they can open up to you and let you know how they're feeling, where you could push and where you need to pull back. I think it's important. We try to put ourselves in their shoes a lot, but I think, some, I mean, realistically, we're going to miss it sometimes. You know, we're going to think that they're feeling great and we're going to push a little too hard. And, uh, and it might cost us a little bit. So I think it's important to develop a good relationship with those guys or those girls, whoever you're working with, and, uh, and see how they're feeling. Find out what we could all do better, not only from our side, but from the, from the sports side as well. Uh, that kind of bleeds into my next thing. I think it's important to have a personality that allows you to have a good time with your players. There should be certain times where you're, you're very authoritative, in the weight room and things have to go a certain way, but then there's gotta be times where you can lighten up the whole room and just be like, Hey, it's really not that serious, but let's, but let's, uh, let's get our work in. Um, another point that I have here is always make the main goal, the main goal. When I was, uh, a young coach, sometimes you would be, you'd be having a good session and it would be, Speed and uh, rate of force development was the goal of the session. But then maybe you didn't feel like you were getting enough volume. So somewhere in there, you might have wanted to add some volume. So when preparing it, we, we tried to add volume somewhere. But 
I, I think the more you learn, the more you need to actually make whatever the main goal of the session is or the block or the or the uh, the micro cycle or whatever it may be. Like, let's make that the main goal and not stray off of that too far. Um, I think kind of at the end of the day, to be successful, you, you, you've got to get lucky at some some point. It's like, like I said, when I, when I got my first full-time position, I was not even looking. I met the, the guy that called me for my, for my interview. I had met him like once, maybe twice on some random occasion. I didn't know that he was the, the, the head strength coach hiring at this university. I had no idea. But he gave me a call and he gauged my interest. And I feel like I got really lucky in that scenario. In a lot of scenarios, every scenario in strength and conditioning through, through my professional career, I've gotten extremely lucky. Yeah, so. there's a lot of really, really good stuff there, man. A lot of really good stuff. I think the, the key is kind of just preparation is what helps you get lucky. If you prepare yourself enough, something's going to come up. And, and if you're ready for it, then that's your quote unquote luckiness. Like if you're just not doing anything and you're just very stary, staying very stagnant, not doing any continuing yet or talking to people, opportunities may come up, they may not, but if they do, you're not going to be ready for it. Where if at least you're preparing and you're working hard, something comes up, you're ready for it. So, yeah, that would be my general how to obtain success. And I think specifically in professional baseball, I, I can use it in one word. And, and it's adaptability. I, I, I came into this, uh, I came into this uh, realm of work, I guess you could say, professional baseball from the college setting, which I compare a lot of things to, where I had 16 racks, 16 platforms, 16 workstations to deal with when I had baseball. And a lot of times I would train all 35 guys at one time. <laughs> And now I compare it to what I've had the last two seasons. And I feel like the weight room that we have uh, at our high aid facility is actually really good. But there's only two racks. There's a couple of uh, rowing implements. And there's a set of dumbbells and some, some uh, step up and some rear foot elevated attachments and stuff like that. But when I compare it to what I had three years ago, I mean, it's, it's very minuscule. So... There's got to be some adaptability that goes on. And also, a, it's not just like when the guys get to the yard at 12 o'clock or whatever it is, and they have that time to work out, sometimes the pitching coach will grab them or the hitting coach will grab them, and they need to show them some stuff that's going on with their with their swing or their pitching mechanics or stuff. So, like, there's a the rope's kind of pulling these players in all kind of different directions. So we need to... One, like I mentioned before, have a good relationship with them, know what's going on, and then uh, also be able to adapt. I like to I like to train the guys hard in season, and I think it's doable. But you got to be smart about it. They can't just go heavy, 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 and never have any kind of, of setback where we pull back on them a little bit. Yeah, that's really, really good, man. And I keep saying it on here. I wish every strength coach could work in professional baseball because – especially in the college setting you get very spoiled with what you have and everything's set on a set time and there's no distraction from you know coaches coming in or whatever and then baseball it's anything goes a lot of the time and you go on the road with the team and you bring your trunk and it's like all right I got a TRX a couple of dumbbells and some bands and a med ball like what kind of workout can I get in and I think if other coaches had that experience it would open their eyes to how much and how valuable the strength coach in professional baseball does or is and does like it's right. it's really underappreciated position I think at times and people don't realize even in our own field like how much adaptability comes with being in professional baseball yeah so uh, do you have any advice for others in the field maybe young coaches looking to get in or even older coaches that have just been around who just want to stay on top of things yeah and, and I think I think I need to do a better job of taking my own advice when I say it's important wherever you live or for our, uh, with our job, we get to move around a little bit and go to different cities. It's important to contact strength coaches that may be in the area, whether it's teams that you're playing, that you're visiting or that are visiting you, or uh, in the, in the example where I lived in Lynchburg for the last two seasons, 
uh, and they have Liberty University is right there. Uh, the that's like the collegiate Taj Mahal of, of weight rooms. I mean, I think it's big, big. It leads around to a football field. It's beautiful. Uh, then also when I come back here, I've got I've got Louisiana Lafayette, which is right in the uh, right in my backyard. That I should I should be uh, contacting strength coaches there because they're not the same ones as when I was in college, and just getting to know their philosophies, talking to them about uh, different things that they may be utilizing uh, for speed development uh, in the weight room, readiness uh, protocols that they're doing. Uh, rehab protocols, whatever it may be, you need to just expand your expand your uh, toolbox, so to speak, and uh, learn what they're doing. And also just reading, reading different materials. That's one thing that I've I'm really trying to do, and I'm actually currently doing right now uh, during this off season period is taking advantage of just reading and obtaining a ton of knowledge, and hopefully with the thought that you could use it later on. Um, so I'm reading, I'm, I'm going to try to read at least like four or five books this off season uh, that have been recommended to us. And also just some stuff that I'm interested in uh, to hopefully uh, just continue my own education personally. Yeah. Let's roll with that point, man. Where are you going for continuing it? The books that you're going to read or um, any podcasts you listen to, seminars that you might mm -hmm. attend this off season. Where are you going to to get that knowledge this off season? You're talking about. So I'm um, traveling. Like I said, I'm going to go to uh, our Dominican complex for uh, for their instructs over there that they're doing. Uh, I'm going to be there for about 14 days. So that's going to be one one spot where um, I'd like to talk to the staff there. There's some of the staff members there I've never met, so I'd like to talk to the staff and also get their um, their thoughts on uh, on things that may be going on or what they see from our really younger players, some of the guys that I've never met, and as they move up and what we can continue to do to help those guys out. But uh, as far as books, the the one book I'm really reading right now that I like, it's called, it was an e-book. It was sent to us. Uh, our coordinator sent it to us. I really liked it. Um, it, it kind of related to some of the things I tried to do this year when I was in Lynchburg with uh, some of our players, and it's called Applied Principles of Optimal Power Development. So it's basically just talking about different ways, uh, theoretical strategies that you could use to um, to optimize their power development or their rate of force development. That's the one I'm on right now. Uh, I don't have too much left on it. Now I'm going to move. I don't know if I'm going to move back to this one because I've read it already, but I'd like to reread it. It's pretty, it's pretty thick. It's called the Speed Encyclopedia. So it talks about different um, speed improvement drills, speed mechanic drills, and then actually some actual speed drills itself using implements, like maybe like a sled, plyometrics, stuff like that. Then it actually talks about stripping them all down and just l learning how to run fast. So uh, I want to read that one again. I have a I read it like three years ago, and I don't think I, I retained all the information. I was just so focused on finishing it and being like, yeah, yeah, I finished the book. But I need to go back over it and read it again. Then uh, I want to reread uh, the principles of triphasic training. We used that. We, we, we kind of um, made our own model of it a couple of off-seasons ago and used it uh, within our uh, one of our strength camps. Um, I didn't. I didn't develop the program, but they did, and uh, and it worked really well. I mean, it, it, it's it's pretty taxing, and you have to be like uh, very smart about the volume and the intensity there. But uh, I'd like to go reread it and see, and see if I could uh, dig in a little bit more as to what they did. And I would like to find a book on diet and nutrition for myself as well as uh, some of our players. Some of our players during the end season will have a lot of questions about what they should be eating when they should be eating, which I think uh, the timing of your nutrient intake is very important. So I want to find uh, some books to read. I don't know any right now, so if you know any, please let me know. But a lot of our players just want to, uh, they want to have a better idea of what and when to eat. And I just basically go off of what I know or personally what I've tried. Um, and then the, the last book that I'm, I'm trying to read is uh, one that I got a while back, but I haven't dug into. It's called Movement Over Maxes. I'm sure every strength coach in the world knows about it. Um, the more I hear about it, 
the more I think it, it, it's a little bit deeper than just uh, progressions and regressions of exercises. I, I, I think it goes much deeper than that. But like I said, I haven't even opened it up yet. So I need to, I need to do that. Those yep. are the books. Yeah, what about, uh, no, no, I was going to say, what about podcasts, seminars, anything like that outside of reading that you're going to do? You know, I'm guilty, I'm guilty on, on, on the podcast. I don't listen to many podcasts. I don't, um, I don't exactly know where to download them from. If you can give me, give me an idea of where to get some, some things from, I'd love to start doing that because I'm sure there's some great content out there, uh, some stuff that I could listen to on the drives. I make a lot of drives during the off-season period. I would love, I would love to listen to some information on speed development, uh, power output, and weight room stuff. Um, and then as far as conferences, the only – the, the biggest conference I've been to and the one that I've liked the most, it's not during the off-season period, but it's the uh, it's the CSCCA conference that's held every May. It's like the first week in May, and pretty much every collegiate strength coach goes there because it's the only time where you know classes aren't in session or they're taking finals or something, but we would all go, and it's at uh, one location, obviously, and it's, man, it's, it's awesome. I don't I really, really like it. There's a ton of strength coaches there. You can network. You can see uh, people that you used to work with. And then you also go to all the seminars that are going on during the day. And uh, they're very informative. So uh, I really like that one if I was to attend one. I won't get to attend the um, the NSCA conference this year because it's during a – we're going to have some off-season programs going on, and I won't be able to attend that. But that's one that I really – anyone that's not in professional baseball and has some time to – go to the CSCCA conference. It's every May. It's like the first week in May. It's awesome. Yeah, I have a few friends still in the college ranks, and they go to that every year, and they, they really, really enjoy it. They've spoken very highly of it. Yeah, it's great. So uh, I'd like to do a lightning round with you. You got a little bit of time for me to get it done? We got some time. Ready All, right. The lightning round. All right, cool. First one, biggest influence in the field of strength and conditioning. Who is it? Uh, can I say two people? Sure. The The... the the first person we've already named him, uh, the guy that I walked into his office and he gave me the start, his name is uh, Coach Rusty Witt. He's now with, uh, I believe he's an assistant on the Army staff, the Army football staff. Perfect place for him because he used to be in the Army. Um, but anyway, he, he, gave me, he gave me a start in trending and conditioning, and he showed so much care for the players and for his job. He, he was so serious about his job. Like, it was... It was, it was a very, very good first experience for me, and the players respected him. I mean, that was the most amount of respect I've seen anyone display towards one single person. And then the other guy would be uh, Brett Huth. He was the uh, he was kind of the guy who um, let me intern with them at uh, Louisiana Monroe. He's now the head strength coach at uh, the University of the Incarnate Word in San Antonio, their football team. A lot of people haven't heard of that university, but they'll probably be hearing about him pretty soon. Last year was uh, his first; uh, it was his first year on staff. That whole staff was brand new, and they actually won that conference championship. It's a smaller Division One school. They, we were in the same conference when I was at McNeese. Uh, we never played against each other, but we we're in the same conference. And uh, you know he. He sat me down many, many times and just told me about his philosophy, why he programs a certain way, what he does. He And he had to teach himself because he's always been a football guy. And he had to teach himself from what he tells me how to uh, how to build a baseball program. So it was, a, it was a very eye-opening experience being in the same room with him every day. I actually have a friend who did a little bit of work down there, um, so I actually do know the university, but it is it is one that not many people have heard when you see him like playing in a college football game. People are like, what is that university? <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. They, they sort of chuckle, but, uh, but I think they're going to be pretty good. Yeah, we'll see. Hopefully, uh, for your at least for the sake of your mentor, they'll be good. Yeah. So, uh, Second right. one, uh, one piece of equipment to train with, what would you choose? I think it's pretty easy. I would choose a barbell. Right on. Accompanying weights. Of course, you know, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I just I, I just think you could do anything you want. I mean, from a squat, you could do 
a back squat, a front squat, a bilateral squat. You can do single leg movements, posterior chain, uh, horizontal uh, hip thrusts. You can do presses, pulls, overhead, uh, core. You can do single arm if you have a landmine attachment. I mean, the, 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 you could do an entire session with a barbell on a platform or at a rack. And that's it. It might be boring. You might, you might, you might. Some people get bored, but I truly believe that the basic fundamentals improve the specific needs of a player in his development. Yeah, I just set up a home gym here at our place in Phoenix, and I literally bought a barbell, plates, and a squat rack that has a pull-up bar on it and a landmine attach attachment on it. And my wife and I have been just going out lifting every day and. I just like if I get bored, I just go back out there and pick up the bar and do something else with it. Like you said, you can do literally anything with a barbell. Anything. I don't know. I don't know what other what other what other things have you heard that that people have said besides the barbell. Um, a lot of baseball guys like the kettlebell just because you can travel with it. It's versatile. You can do a lot of similar stuff. Um, so I think in baseball specifically, that one plays because you can put it in your trunk where. You can't always bring a barbell on the road with you, you know what I mean? So that's been the other big answer, but most guys do say barbell. Okay. Um, biggest accomplishment professionally and or personally? It's tough because I don't, I don't think I've accomplished a, a whole heck of a lot um, in the field. Uh, I, but I, also, I do believe that every, every year has its own sets of uh, challenges and subsequent accomplishments. Um, but I think if I was to put one from being successful into this, this block, there was a, a time when, uh, when I was at McNeese State University from 14 to 17, there was like a two year period there where I got extremely lucky. I got, I got really lucky. I was working with some great, great athletes, some great sport coaches and just some, some really good programs. And in that year and a half to two year, uh, block, we won, I think four or five conference championships outright um and that was that was just really cool it was a really exciting time to be at that university and uh, it's where i really got my start and i was able to do a lot of things and and be unbothered so to speak i made some mistakes certainly uh but i think i did some really good things as well and there's the players there i still keep up with uh we've we had quite a few players sign professional contracts and different sports we actually have one uh, that's going to be in the Olympics. The, I think it's in 2020 in uh, Tokyo. She's going she's gonna to be playing on one of the softball teams in uh, the Olympics. So congratulations to her and all the other athletes uh, there that are still playing. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Sounds like it was a great experience for you. It was awesome. Uh, last one. Any career other than strength and conditioning, what would you choose? <laughs> man, this is, a, this is probably, probably going to turn a couple heads, but I think, I think I would be a nurse. Really? If I would be anything else. Uh, you know, my sister is a nurse, and I just feel like there there's always a need anywhere in this country, or maybe even the world, there's always a need for nursing. So if you wanted to move to Denver, Colorado during the summer, and then you wanted to move to Fort Lauderdale or Miami, Florida during the winter to experience great weather, I think you could do it. I, th I think nursing is set up where you could do those travel jobs where they're like six months at a time or something, and you could do that. I know it would be a lot of studying, but I think it's a very secure job, and it allows you a lot of freedom to move. Yeah, That's and like you said, there's always a need for nurses. Always a need for them, but man, it's a it's a tough. I used to joke on my sister all the time. She'd always be studying. I'm like, come on, nursing's not that hard, and she would get she get really upset with me. Because <laughs> yeah. I was in, I was in kinesiology and she thought it was just working out and it was so easy and this and that. Of course, of course. Hey man, I appreciate you coming on and sharing uh, sharing your stories and your insight with me. If the listeners want to get in touch with you for more, where can we go? Is social media the best place, or is there a better place to go? Man, yeah, social media would be great. You know, I, I don't post a whole lot of stuff in terms of uh, in terms of like my work on there. I mean, sometimes I do, but. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm on uh, Twitter, and I'm on Instagram. It's uh, just Eric underscore Ortigo. Those are my handles or whatever you call them. And then uh, also I've got a uh, couple different email addresses. 
uh, eortigo at indians.com would be one to, to reach me at. I check that one uh, pretty frequently. Cool. Well, like I said, appreciate you coming on, man, and we'll be catching up real soon. Yeah, hey, thank you for having me on. This is my first experience with a podcast interview, and uh, I might have been a little nervous at first and still maybe a little bit, but uh, I feel like it was a good experience. All yeah, all. you did great, man. The, the listeners are going to love it. Okay, well, I appreciate that, man. All right, everybody, that concludes this episode with Eric. I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I thought he made a lot of really, really good points, and uh, I would recommend especially going back into the section where we talked about finding success as a strength coach. Uh, and re-listening to some of the points that he made in that in that area. Three things that I took from Eric in this episode. Be open-minded to learning from others. Contact strength coaches in your area. And keep the main goal the main goal. With that being said, I hope you enjoyed this episode. And we'll talk to you again on the next one.